Donald Trump files a motion exposing the lawfare plot in New York. It is good. It combines all of the different attack vectors that the left and the people in New York, people like Joe Biden orchestrating Matthew Colangelo, orchestrating Alvin Bragg to file charges, create plea deals, leak stuff to the news, all comes together in this brief. And of course, this comes in request for an adjournment of the current trial. This is the Bragg prosecution criminal case scheduled for April 15th. But Trump is asking for the entire indictment to be dismissed because of the prejudice that comes from this lawfare and this political onslaught that's been taking place in New York, saying no one can possibly get a fair trial in this context, in this environment. And so we've got the full filing and some thoughts on the Trump prosecutions from Alina Abba. But let's start here by seeing what Trump is submitting. This filing comes in the Supreme Court of the state of New York. And remember, that's the lower level court in New York. They're backwards like they are with many things. The case is the people of the state of New York. This is Bragg versus Donald Trump. Trial is right around the corner. And this is Trump's motion for a trial adjournment or a dismissal based on prejudice, a prejudicial pretrial publicity. Okay. It's been a circus there in New York. And so we cannot have a fair trial. This is obvious. Here's the introduction from the Trump defense. Says your honor, judge Juan Mercon. President Trump hereby respectfully submits this motion. We want an adjournment, a continuance, a postponement of the trial date because there is exceptional, exceptional prejudice and pretrial publicity. It's ongoing right now and it's likely to be something that increases. And so to be clear about this, the court should dismiss this indictment based on Alvin Bragg's significant and ongoing discovery violations, right? So Alvin is dropping new discovery just day by day, right on the eve of trial and saying the entire indictment should go away. But if the court doesn't dismiss it, because Judge Juan Mercan is not, they say, as it should, following the hearing, a significant adjournment is further supported by two things. One, we got a voluminous batch of discovery, right? A huge dumpster of stuff from the DOJ came to Alvin Bragg, and Alvin Bragg just passed that dumpster along to the defense right in, you know, right in the middle of trial, or right in the, in the moments before trial. And saying it's also supported by prejudicial pretrial publicity. And here's how they know it is such a harsh environment. This is interesting data. Based on a survey of New York, they got a sample of 400 residents from each of New York, Orange, Richmond, Rockland, and Suffolk counties called the survey. And if you look at the survey, it's clear that potential jurors in Manhattan have been exposed to huge amounts of biased and unfair media coverage about this case. And many of the jurors already wrongfully believe that Trump is guilty because that's what they've been told from all the maniacs in the news. A separate review of media coverage that relates to Trump, which is also attached, identified 1,200 online news articles between January and February. Many of these articles provided details about Bragg's allegations and about the evidence and the opinions in this case. And a similarly significant number of articles also identified in our media study talked about prejudicial discussions about inaccurate and irrelevant discussions of alleged misconduct and false claims regarding the R. Right? We hear this all the time. Even guys like George Stephanopoulos. George, uh, Trump are that woman. Uh, no, that's not what the jury found. That's what the judge said. But a jury found that he did not actually found that she was not credible or believable on that one. But a bunch of people have already heard it, right? So they get programmed accordingly, especially when it confirms their, uh, their cognitive biases already. So the fact that President Trump cannot, cannot get a fair trial in New York right now is also underscored by a bunch of its witnesses, by Alvin Bragg and its star witness, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, Clifford. We know that Bragg has used strategic leaks to prejudice President Trump since the early days of this zombie investigation back in 2018. And more recently, Bragg amplified prejudicial coverage relating to Trump and the Trump organization by leaking news of an anticipated guilty plea from Alan Weisselberg, the former Trump CFO. 
saying there is no conceivable explanation for the manufactured timing of Weisselberg's plea other than to try to hurt Trump. Now, the people are also complicit in scheduling Weisselberg's sentencing on April 10th, 24, which will receive news coverage right before jury selection is scheduled to begin in this case on April 15th. So a bunch of bad Trump news right as the jurors are waltzing into the courtroom. Thanks. To anyone who will listen, Trump's defense says, especially if they're paying, Michael Cohen will show up. He has and he will continue to spew vitriol into the public sphere through his perjuring mouth about Trump, including in the buildup to the trial and likely during it. He's going to be running his mouth. Buy my book. Buy my book. Finally, during the first week of March, we learned that Stormy Daniels, during the first week of March, she prepared a, quote, documentary. Ah, oh, great. What kind of documentary, Stormy? With prejudicial and false commentary about this case and Trump. She already screened it to a conference audience in Texas on March 8th, not too long ago. Now, look, we've got a redacted sentence here. Oh. On March 12th, the people, Alvin Bragg, disclosed for the first time that Michael Cohen, you know, I don't know what it is, that Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniel got together in a dressing room at Bergdorf's. I don't know. Clifford, they say something, something, the people disclosed for the first time that redacted, 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 redacted. Clifford premiered the documentary in Brooklyn, New York on March 18th and released it to NBC's Universal Peacock perfect platform for her streaming service on the same day. Now, in addition to these discovery violations, which warrant dismissal, the prejudicial pretrial publicity driven by Bragg and their witnesses has jeopardized Trump's right to a fair trial. And for all these reasons, this is something that should be adjourned until the prejudicial media coverage subsides, which of course will never happen. Now, here are the facts. They say, first of all, Alvin Bragg has been leaking intentionally about this case, right? This is lawfare in action. You have a court of law, court of public opinion, and you have the power of both. You've got the power of the state to prosecute. And of course, you've got the, the bully pulpit of the position to go out in the court of, of public opinion and say what you want with the heft of your office behind you. Saying beginning in early 2021, Alvin Bragg, campaigned based on the argument that he had more experience with Trump than most people in the world. Bragg said that he could convict President Trump. They all run against Trump. One of Bragg's campaign ad advertisements wrongfully linked Harvey Weinstein and Trump's children and suggested that the famous and privileged had improperly escaped prosecution because of their high-powered legal teams rather than the reality of the situation, which is that they didn't commit a crime. Now, in May, Washington Post and Associated Press reported that the people had convened a special grand jury to investigate Trump. The AP story was attributed, quote, to a person familiar with the matter who was not authorized to speak. So we get all these news stories that just drop. Okay, how did the Washington Post and the AP know about this? I don't know. It's, it's, it's special grand jury. It's all secret. Not supposed to talk about any of this. It's all kept under dark at night, lock and key. But someone leaked it to WAPO and AP. Huh. Must be Alvin Bragg's office, right? On November 24th, the New York Times ran an article. Trump investigation enters a crucial phase as prosecutors term nears an end. And the article was sourced with, quote, people who have knowledge of the matter. New York Times, you know, brain dead writers over there. Now, by February 22, Bragg was deciding whether to bring charges against Trump. Mark Pomerantz and his prosecutor colleagues learned that the New York Times was preparing to publish an article indicating that the grand jury was on pause. And they were very upset about that, right? Mark Pomerantz was the other guy. And he wrote about, he wrote a whole book about this, People versus Donald Trump, an inside account. By his own account, Pomerantz says he threatened Bragg that the Times would learn of his and Kerry Dunn's resignations very quickly. So remember, Mark Pomerantz and Kerry Dunn were these two guys who were basically volunteering to prosecute Trump. They like showed up. We're going to go get him. Bragg says we're not going to bring the case. 
he throws a hissy fit. I'm going to go tell the New York Times about our resignation and suggesting that the time also learned that DA Vance had already, so Vance was the outgoing DA, previously directed the team to push forward with the charges. The Times ran the story, reporting that Bragg had serious doubts about the case, and Bragg's serious doubts about the case caused those two other prosecutors to leave. Yeah, New York Times started article, right? So they threw, like they resigned in anger, okay? that Like they resigned in protest. Alvin Bragg's not bringing the case. We resign. He writes a book about it. Something happens. In March 2022, more than one year before the indictment and before locking her Twitter account, okay, Bragg's wife, Mrs. Bragg, she reposted on social media that there was, quote, finally a bit of good news in the Manhattan DA criminal case against Trump because people have nailed Trump on felonies, right? So out Bragg's wife is like, yeah, get Trump. In January of 23, NPR also reported. So, okay, so just as a quick recap, all right, these two prosecutors wrote in their book, Get Trump. Bragg's wife writes on Twitter, Get Trump. Washington Post, get leaks from Alvin Bragg, Get Trump. New York Times, hears from people familiar, Get Trump, right? All of it's coming from Alvin Bragg. Now, in January 2023, NPR reported that Bragg was once again presenting evidence to a grand jury. How did NPR know about it? Oh, yeah, Alvin Bragg's office. They were talking about payments related to Stormy Daniels. Never ending. In March of 23, the New York Times reported that Alvin had signaled to President Trump's lawyers he could face criminal charges. How did they know about it? In late 23 of March, Politico reported that Manhattan grand jury examining this case was not expected to hear evidence for several weeks, but the source noted that it was entirely possible that the grand jury had already voted. Again, more leaks. So all going to the media timed against Trump. Now here are some more prejudicial statements. On April 4th, Bragg sought to amplify the prejudicial media coverage. He issued a press release and a quote statement of facts. He didn't release allegations. He held a press conference about the indictment of Trump. Now, the statement of facts that he released suggested improperly that separate violations of the law could be used as object offenses to escalate charges to felonies, which is a legal theory that the court recently rejected. Now, at a press conference, Bragg was also there making gratuitous and prejudicial references to matters involving sex crimes that has no relevance to this case, right? You know, sex crime is, you know, uh, what what Miss Bergdorf claimed happened to her, which actually wasn't even a crime because she didn't report it as, as a crime. Those were two civil allegations. So not even that. But, you know, you think of assaults and uh, the R's, right? Those are the different types of actual crimes. This is a contract case that, that he's saying he falsified business records. So he didn't commit any crimes like that at all. It's not even the subject of this case. Now, during a December 2023 radio interview, despite the court's acknowledgement that extrajudicial comments by Bragg or their witnesses could influence the jury pool, Bragg didn't care. He commented on his office's case against Trump on the radio. Seeking to appeal to New York County residents, Bragg said that he rebranded this prosecution to align with the prosecution out of D.C. Hmm. Bragg stated in contradicting himself that the case, you know, the core of it is not money for intercourse. It's not the core of the case. We would say it's about conspiring to corrupt a presidential election and then lying in New York business records to cover it up. Right. So it's again, it's not a contract case. It is an insurrection again. So he's good. He got you know a memo from Liz Cheney or Matthew Colangelo. So here are some other false claims. Now, Michael Cohen has been running his mouth since April 2023. Michael, convicted liar, has released at least 160 podcasts discussing President Trump. Wow. They're going to have a real hard time when, you know, he's not around anymore, including a public declaration that he is not intimidated and ready to strike back. Now, in the last two months, titles of Cohen's podcasts have included ex-FBI agent tells Michael Cohen why Trump is screwed. Former top DOJ prosecutor says 
Trump is screwed, re re reveals all the Cohen. Prosecutor who investigates Trump hits him with crushing blows. Michael Cohen pounces. Great titles there, Michael. In February 15th, in an interview on CNN, Cohen claimed to be speaking on the basis of non-public evidence in the people's possession. Cohen said, I believe, based on information that I know and based upon not just the documentary evidence, but the corroborating testimony from so many people, I believe that he will be found guilty on all charges, says Cohen. Cohen has spewed similarly prejudicial and false claims to his more than 600,000 followers on X. But was Cohen gagged or did Trump get gagged yesterday? Cohen didn't get gagged at all. Cohen's free to run his mouth and he will continue to do that. But Trump cannot respond to Michael Cohen because Trump got gagged. How's that for fair? Now, in February 25, in a mea culpa episode entitled Michael Cohen and Malcolm Nance Exposed the Trump-Putin Insurgency. Oh, here we go again. Russia collusion again. Michael, you already got in trouble for lying about this in 2018 already. Cohen drew attention to other politically motivated cases involving Trump and made a series of prejudicial and defamatory analogies. Cohen praised the testimony of Fannie during recent hearings about ethical violations. He's, she's great. That's exactly what I would do, is what he says. Falsely claimed that Trump would act as a copycat to Vladimir Putin. Okay, we already saw this season. You already played this in season one. Don't do it again. And they accused Trump of being a dictator. Very clever. And they discussed spreading the message of vote blue. Okay. Now, Cohen continued. He continued with a similar tack during another interview in March entitled Cohen and Popak team up to deliver nightmare legal news. Now, during this episode, Cohen made false references to Trump as a monarch, as a dictator, as a Fuhrer, referring to Hitler, as the supreme leader. Cohen also added that Trump would use his SEAL Team 6 to, quote, incarcerate or uh, Supreme Court judges and politicians and member of the media and bring billionaires to him and do what Mohammed bin Salman did. And he says the, uh, an, an F word in the podcast, very, very inappropriate. Now, on March 3rd, Cohen published yet another episode. Michael Cohen and Donnie Deutsch on Trump going broke. Cohen said Trump should have been arrested for interfering with national security by campaigning near the border. Cohen said campaigning near the border is treason. And he falsely claimed that Trump is operating a shadow government. As a former president, he's communicating with members of the public. So that's going to be their star witness. Without Michael Cohen, there is no Letitia James case or Alvin Bragg prosecution. And he was just accused of lying again by a federal judge in Tish's case. So prejudicial publicity also was very problematic in the E. Jean Carroll case, which we covered extensively here. Beginning back on January 16th, E. Jean Carroll brought her fake case, in my opinion, against Trump. Trump was not permitted to defend himself against her underlying allegations. He's already denied that. There's been one-sided coverage, been in the mainstream news in New York for all time. Jury returned a damages verdict in favor of Carroll, which has been going on on a nearly daily basis, covered extensively all over the news. Bragg also strategically timed Alan Weisselberg's plea deal. Consistent with their unethical practices, the office leaked information about the plea to the media. Weisselberg is scheduled to be sentenced on the 10th, Trump's jury selection scheduled for the 15th, which we're covering. They say during an April 2024 interview, Stormy Daniels has been running her mouth too. Now, in response to a question about this case, Clifford Stormy said, for my own sake, I'd like vindication. I'd like him to see what's coming for once. Now, however, Clifford plainly wants more than that, probably. She's always trying to make money based on this case and other activities, which is perhaps related to the fact that she owes President Trump approximately $670,000. Yeah, that's a big fat bill there, Stormy. This month, her attorney has even suggested that she may file another defamation case against Trump along the same line as Carol's which at least one commentary properly regarded as, at best, a long shot, right? So she's mad, right? She, she has an ax to grind. She's got a $670,000 debt 
against Trump and she's got a motive of, you know, vindictive now to go make sure he gets taken out. Since January, Clifford has released at least seven podcasts that mention Trump. For example, in January 11th podcast, she wrongfully claimed that Trump is indeed a monster and that the people who do his bidding are in fact evil and his ride or die followers like tens of millions of voters are effing insane, says Stormy Daniels. Are effing insane. Trump supporters are effing insane. This is the this is the woman who worked with Michael Avenatti. Yeah, she's a good judge of character. So the strategically timed release of her documentary is also done to hurt Trump specifically, saying Stormy's public comments have been so inappropriate that the people were forced to admonish her. Okay, according to her own statement, she says, "I've been asked to you know kind of behave." I'm biting my tongue so effing hard right now. She's got a bad mouth too. She has not heeded those admonishments. Now on the evening of March 7th, the media said Stormy is releasing a documentary called Stormy, yeah, by Calvin Klein. On NBC Universal, Peacock released a two minute, 12 second trailer, which includes Stormy describing herself of quote, out of F's to give, you know, I'm out of F's to give and an idiot who can't keep her mouth shut. The trailer shows an excerpt of an agreement that is subject to the court's protective order. She asserts in the video trailer that stuff got real when Trump got the Republican nom in 16. She reads highly prejudicial threats not connected to Trump, such as a random person stating, you signed your death warrant, right? You know, whoa, that's a, that's, you know, that's, did Trump say that? No, just some random person did. Okay, so why are you, saying that that's Trump. A male associate claims that unspecified people with no connection to Trump tried to bring guns into her events. The trailer ends with an effort to bolster Clifford's anticipated testimony through the claim that she won't give up because she's telling the truth. Now in the version of the documentary that was produced to the defense, Clifford makes additional extremely prejudicial and false claims contradicting previous claims Stormy now falsely suggests that her made up encounter with Trump may have been non-consensual. Oh yeah. So all of a sudden she got Bergdorfed too. Yeah. Just like E. Jean did. Oh, I got Bergdorf. When? I don't know. 30 years ago. Oh, perfect. She said, I thought we had this mutual respect, which is why it's so crazy when having no red flags whatsoever in the conversation, I, Stormy says, I came out of the bathroom to find myself cornered. I don't remember how I got on the bed. And the next thing that I know, he was just pounding away and telling me how great I was. It was awful, but I didn't say no. <laughs> oh, she, I was terrified. I mean, people had been suspiciously eliminated for political reasons all the time. It was really about two things, trying to keep the story from coming out so that I wouldn't lose my husband and my daughter and so that I wouldn't lose my life and that there would be a paper trail and money trail linking me to Donald so that he would not have me taken out. Like, who's she talking about? Clinton? All right. So on March, hey, that's from her, her, her ridiculous documentary. All right. She's like, I'm a hero. She's probably going to say she's the face of feminism now and that she's got role models. She's a role model like Fanny. On March 8th, Clifford screened her documentary at the South by Southwest conference in Austin. She used the platform to declare F Trump. Now on March 12th, 2024, I don't know why this is redacted, but the people disclosed for the first time that something happened here. Stormy's documentary, something happened. The people told us for the very first time that something happened at that documentary. Now the documentary premiered in Brooklyn and it was released on Peacock the same day. So if you're a subscriber, you can go over there and of course watch it. Now they tell us that we have, right, we're fast forwarding through some of the case law. They say all that being said, okay, all of that lawfare, all of that media onslaught, all of his coordination to sync this attack up across multiple vectors results in the following says, Alvin Bragg's discovery violations, they serve as strong and an independent basis to dismiss this case or to adjourn it, as does the Supreme Court's upcoming consideration of the immunity doctrine. There has been prejudicial pretrial publicity driven by Bragg, driven by Cohen and driven by Clifford. We've documented it here and it violates Trump's rights under the Constitution. 
the entire veneer has been saturated. The survey shows that people are highly anti-Trump. On March 10th, during this week, George Stephanopoulos, which we covered this here because Trump is suing George for this, George Stephanopoulos claimed more than 10 times, falsely and irresponsibly, that Trump had been found liable for the Bergdorf. In fact, the opposite is true, obviously. Trump was found not liable for Bergdorfing. Nevertheless, the false and defamatory statements were viewed millions of times. Nearly all Manhattan residents, 95% who were surveyed, had been exposed to news about Trump. 93% said that they had seen stories about the investigation. Of those 93, 63% said that they had seen media reports about relating to all of the following. The criminal prosecution in D.C., the criminal prosecution in Florida, the Fannie case and the Bragg case and the Carroll case, okay? All five of them. 63% got all five. That's crazy. The survey demonstrated an even greater level of veneer exposure to extrajudicial information related to this case. 88% had read or heard about the hush money payments. 84% had heard about the charges brought by Bragg. The study also adds force. 1,200 online articles about this, a mention in 455 New York Times articles, 343 articles in the Post and Politico, right? And everyone, the media has nothing else to talk about, especially the anti-Trumpers, like they're on it all day. And, you know, we're, you know, by, by some accounts, the opposite of that, right? Defending him against all of these attacks. The media study has also identified sentences discussing the search terms of the 1200 articles, 18, 800 me, um, mentions and a bunch of different felony mentions. Okay, here you go. Here's, here's the numbers. Judge Juan Mercon, Manhattan trial. At the national and local levels in New York County, many of the articles, here, here's the number of the articles. Okay, a lot. They're talking about all the cases. Judge Juan Mercon, the word, you know, star, P star, and so on. Stormy Daniels, Karen McDougal, Access Hollywood tape. There is an extraordinary amount of case-specific coverage over a six-week period. Many of those articles had extended discussions about Bragg's allegations, and they made no presumption of innocence at all. The media study also shows that there was prejudicial coverage that was related to highly inflammatory articles, saying that Trump has been unfairly and improperly demonized in the coverage. All true. Now, the articles identified in the study said that there were 548 mentions about J6, other mentions about insurrection, tons of mentions about Capitol riot, all the stuff. And prejudicial coverage is extremely problematic. So the other cases are spilling over into this case, right? The J6 case, the Florida case. And Trump can't get a fair trial until all this calms down. Especially the E. Jean Carroll case, right? That's a really spicy one. People keep hearing the word grape. They keep hearing the word assault, grab them by the purse, you know, all that stuff. They go, wow, the Graper is here? The Mr. Bergdorf is back here again? So in addition to the foregoing, the bias coverage presents against Trump in another way. The media study discusses juror anonymity. And so basically they say the data reflects a bombardment of the community with pre-trial publicity that results in prejudicial effect in this veneer. Saying, by the way, New York County, just as a, as a factual matter, is overwhelmingly biased against President Trump. Here are the numbers by the, by the charts, man. Would you describe yourself as being biased either in favor of or against President Trump? New York, as we see here all the various counties biased against is going to be in dark blue. So New York County, 60% biased against biased in favor is 16%. Very biased against is in light blue. Okay. So I don't know how this is working exactly, but 60% plus 50% New York is so anti-Trump, New York County, it's 110% actual bias. Look at that. Unbelievable. So 
I don't know, you know how the numbers got made up, whatever, but that you can see that's the, that's the, that's a big percentage. Okay. It's a big chunk of people do not like Trump biased against and very biased against make up this portion in orange County. So very biased in favor are going to be in the greens. So in Richmond County, 34 plus 29 percent in Rockland County, 37 plus 29 in Suffolk County, 36 plus 29 percent. So big, big bias against Trump. That's why they're there in New York. Now, the people have sought to make their case a review of Trump's victory in 2016. So they, they want people to protest that. Now, we've objected to those efforts. But recent and respondents accounts of their voting history sheds light on the improper purpose behind the prosecutorial strategy. Here's another question. Thinking back, so they, they surveyed 400 residents there. Thinking back to 2016 and 2020, which candidate did you vote for? New York County, 2016, Trump was at 15%. Clinton, 71%. Huh. 2020, Trump got 13%. Biden got 75%. Now in 2024, Biden's way down. Look at that number. He's not looking well, good for them. 58% dropped way down to 18% for Trump. Still obviously, you know, over double in terms of the margins. So that same pattern continues for the other counties there, but you can see the numbers are just astronomical. So 2020, 75% for Joe. And Trump's going to get a fair trial there? Okay. Voters in New York overwhelmingly are in favor of Trump's opponents in 16 and 20. And they're trying to make this case about a referendum on Trump. Now, they also say that the, there's negative opinions about Trump. Here's the question. What is your opinion about Trump? And what is your understanding of Trump's overall reputation among the general public? So... Negative is a personal opinion. The percent is negative. Okay, so this is negative and this is a general public opinion. So what is your opinion and what is your understanding of the public's opinion? Okay, so two interesting questions. So your opinion, and they're pretty clear, right? They actually match up kind of sim simultaneously. Isn't that interesting? So people will say, well, I think Trump is very negative, right? Very negative, 77%. What's the public? Well, in New York, they're probably not as negative as I am. So, you know, maybe 69%, right? It's, it's, it's close, but not quite. Orange County, I think that 50% uh, of the public have a very negative opinion of the general public. I'd say 46%, you know, say about, or say that. So whatever the numbers are, you can see big numbers. Now, herd mentality, mob mentality is a psychological phenomenon that impacts people. And so when a bunch of people are following the herd, they're also going to follow the herd. And so negative opinions about Trump, as well as other people's beliefs, are the basis for supporting adjournment. Here's another question. Now, based on the recent media reports, have you formed any opinions as to whether Trump is innocent or guilty? Here you go. Total guilty in New York before the case has ever been heard. And this is this bye-bye presumption of innocence. Nice, nice knowing you. New York County. 61% of people say Trump is already guilty. 40% or of the questioners, okay, again, these numbers are adding up to more than 100, so I don't know exactly how they're calculating these, but the, the result is 40, say definitely guilty, not guilty is 12%, and definitely not guilty is 6%. So maybe they're not percentages, just quantify them, okay? and look at the ratio between the two. Big, big difference. The 61% figure is striking in light of the Supreme Court's reasoning, where the court found that a belief by 67% of the jurors, like eight out of 12, that he was already guilty shows there is a deep and bitter prejudice. When you're in that range, you say this, we can't have a fair trial here. Now those biased views carry over here. 35% of New York County respondents indicate that they believe Trump is guilty of the charges at issue, while 23% say he is definitely guilty. 26% of the respondents said they believe Trump was guilty based on recent reports. 24% said he was guilty based on a verdict or a judge's decision. Less than half indicated that the media coverage had not caused them to form opinions. 
And so these figures show that this has saturated the veneer. And why is this a problem? It's because Alvin Bragg is driving it. Less than a year has passed between when the Alvin filed this indictment and today. Upon filing, Alvin sought to stoke press coverage, including his April 4th press release, and the media attention has been at a high level since that time. And more recently, Bragg has taken steps to ensure that this prejudicial coverage continues. He discussed a new theory of the prosecution back in 2023 in December. He leaked to the media information about Weisselberg. And the New York Times has all, you know, wrote about this more than 25 times. They are trying to coerce guilty pleas from Weisselberg. And moreover, in recent months, the Bragg witnesses, Cohen and Clifford, have repeatedly made defamatory and improper statements all over the place. Cohen's recent tirades have said this on X. This is your star witness, Alvin. Cohen sought to blame Trump for Cohen's crimes, claiming that Trump, claiming Cohen said, I did 13 effing months plus 51 days of solitary confinement because Donald Von Pants can't keep his something in his pants. Wow. And then argued that Trump is lying and stupid. Okay, so this dude like was totally unhinged, whatever that show was. Cohen's referred to the defense team. He called, Michael Cohen called the defense team, Donald Van Effing poops in his pants. And he's ongoing, continuous, derated lawyers and asserted that Trump would sell this country out. And I've said if he was in prison for a bag of tuna and for a book of stamps. Cohen also noted that mea culpa has been downloaded more than 300 million times. Wow. Claiming that everyone should be fearful of Trump. He referred to Trump's youngest son, Barron, and asserted that authorities should ship Trump off to an effing gulag right up to the North Pole with no shoes, no sweater, no jacket, and let him freeze to death out there on the North Pole. What a nice guy. How come Jen Psaki doesn't ask him questions about that? Hmm. There can be little doubt that Cohen will continue to use social media to smear Trump. And Stormy's objective is clear. She released her Stormy documentary just days before the trial was scheduled to begin. That was all done intentionally. Then she realized, oops, the trial got postponed. Right? She, was, she thought, I'm going to release it early, then trial's going to happen, and trial got continued. And so jurors cannot be expected to set aside their biases here. Okay? Here's the summary. 61% of respondents already think Trump is guilty. Okay, 61%. 77% have a negative opinion of Trump. 70% have a very negative opinion of Trump. 71% voted for Hillary. 75% voted for Joe. 58% plan to vote for Joe. That's a pretty big number. They're probably freaked about that. All that being said, we cannot expect them to set aside their political views. The people have made clear that they're going to talk about 2016. They're going to talk about the E. Jean Carroll case and all of it. And so, as you can see, great filing by Todd Blanche says the quantitative findings in the survey support the conclusions that the conduct of Alvin and Cohen and Clifford are so bad that we need a new trial. We need a continuance of the trial or a dismissal of this case because we cannot get a fair trial in Manhattan right now. And therefore, to the extent that the indictment survives, and it shouldn't, it should be dismissed, this court must adjourn the trial until the prejudicial press coverage abates so that Trump can have sufficient time to review these productions. Signed by Todd Blanche, Susan Nicholas, great attorneys. Of course, you can find out more from Todd Blanche at blanchelaw.com. And he's got some great filings that are posted there as well if you're looking for court docs. But this is... The motion from Trump telling the court, Judge Juan Mercan, that this case needs to be postponed if you're not going to dismiss it because there's no way we can get a fair shake. Three-fourths of the people, if you round up, 70-plus percent of the people have strong antipathy against Trump. And you can see how clearly this whole thing kind of unfolded, right? They waited years for this to all drop. And Trump says, there's no way that we can have a fair shake. And so we have to postpone this. Now, Alina Abba is, of course, responding to a lot of this lawfare and the legal onslaught that Trump is facing in multiple jurisdictions. She was on with 
Newsmax, and here is Alina Abba. What will happen is that the bond will be held um, effectively in escrow by the appellate division so that we can lay that case out. And what we asked them She's to talking do about the Tish um, case. was prevent Miss James and this judge from moving forward with taking assets that we could never get back because the bond was so insane that nobody had ever heard of it, that the largest insurance carriers couldn't do it, wouldn't do it, um, unless you effectively have a billion dollars in cash sitting in your bank, which is poor judgment if you are a wealthy individual. You put that money to work, just like Trump does. So, you know, the $175 million, yeah, it's a lot of money, and it's, it's insane that we're even in this situation. However, we had to pay it so that we could be afforded some due process and have them look at what happened in that trial that I sat through for the better of four months. I just don't understand how an appeals court could look at a case where, you know, again, to, to, to restate it, but, I mean, you have the bank that it would allegedly be the victim in a case like this. You know, they're testifying on behalf of former President Trump and saying they do it all over again. Their actuaries looked over his valuation. Yeah, they made money. They he was a whale fine. client. They loved How this How the dude. hell do you not throw something like that out? Right. It's not just that. Also, Rob, we had ridiculous rulings day in, day out. Uh, gag orders. Speaking of the gag order that came out today, yeah. I was gagged. Um, as an attorney officer of the court representing a client, I was gagged in court. Now, that's very By different than Alina Hobbes' spokeswoman case. can't go on TV. I was not only not allowed to go on TV, I couldn't speak in court and put things on a record so that I had a record for appeal on certain issues that we felt were very important. So I think cases like this, where, you know, for lack of a better word, the Trump derangement takes over and their judgment as attorneys and judges fails them. Um, they are easier to win on an appeal than others, yeah. but it does take those judges to take off any political animus or bias and apply rule of law and the law to fact. And if they do so, Rob, I really do believe we will get this reversed. That one's ridiculous. Coangelo J and with because we know that him and Merrick Garland are boys. They send up this guy to work on these state cases that aren't directly connected to the DOJ. So now everything is kind of under the DOJ's purview in one way or another. They have their people controlling these outside cases, and you know that Merrick Garland is, you know, the is puppet on master board with moving the all of them around. Uh, this this is the filthy dirty, and, and nobody is watching, and nobody, nobody has a problem with this. And as I call him in the White House, he is um, truly there is obviously a coordinated effort. There's no question about that. If you have a question about that, go pick up uh, Pomerantz's is all his statements and look at them. Right. Back in the day, this case was looked at. It was investigated. It, charges were not brought. Indictments were not made because they knew the case was not real. Then he ran for office. They bring the charges. If you look at that time loan, the timeline alone, I want to know how they're going to wipe this story away because it speaks volumes. You didn't bring the charges. You said there was no story. You actually lost people that had left law firms solely to intimidate and corroborate against Trump. And then he runs for office and they bring an indictment on this case. And that, that case that's going forward in April is another disgrace and, and shows the demise the of the case. state of New York, which I used to love. It's... Yeah. It's disgusting. Just look at the White House logs. If anybody wants to tell me something's not coordinated, explain to me why a state official, why people that are supposed to be elected by their state and working for their state constituents is now working with the White House administration. It makes no sense. All of them. It makes perfect sense if they are or orchestrating a political attack on their political opponents. It is, doesn't make sense in the court of law, at least in the old court of law that we used to have in America where we didn't like these types of prosecutions happening. We go 234 years in this country without a president being indicted. And then all of a sudden we wake up one year, four of them happen simultaneously, four of them, all by design, all organized at different locations, supplemented by other attacks, civil attacks brought by E. Jean Carroll, ballot removal attacks brought by people in Colorado and elsewhere, and the list goes on and on. And I don't think it's going to stop yet, right? They're, they're constantly trying to create new attacks. They might be, have some regulatory attacks with uh, you know, true social and other things. The floodgates are opening. Trump is explaining clearly that there is a very, very strong possibility that he will be convicted if there is not even a shred of evidence presented, right? The default in New York is Trump is already guilty. 
There is no presumption of innocence there. But Judge Juan Mercan will take a look at this motion. He'll listen to Alvin Bragg say, I think it's fair, and he'll say it's fair, and he'll put this sham trial on, and they are going to do everything they can to try to get him convicted because this is the last grasp for a felony conviction before 2024. No way Rico goes before the, the election. No way. There's no way... I think, I'm hopeful, if we're right, that the J6 case goes because Trump's going to be found immune on that. And that might also kick out the Florida classified documents case. Or if the, if the immunity decision doesn't do it, then the classified document delays that are associated with that will push this back beyond the election. So this is it, man. This is the only thing they've got. We're scheduled for trial April 15th. We're going to be here covering it, my friends. So thank you for subscribing and liking this video wherever it is you are joining us because we're going to be covering this and all of the other Trump trials and all the other litigation in 2024 and the election. And we'd love to see you back here to join us as we cover it. We'd also love it if you invited a friend or family member, text them a link, email them a link, tell them to come join us when we go live here five days a week. It is always great to have your friends and family joining you when you go through the madness. And so we'd love to see them here. We have great links in the description below. We'd love to have you come join our members only community watching the watchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning where we get into some other types of content that we can't squeeze in here on the show. And we have an amazing community there as well. So come and join us. We'll see you back there and back here on the next one.